The past few weeks were very eventful for PLA watchers. Here it's a short summary of the top stories. Two new prototypes took to the sky. One is a significantly revised J-36 next generation combat aircraft. The other one is an advanced trainer jet specifically designed for carrier aviation. Apart from brand new prototypes, we also saw brand new visuals of a quote-unquote old prototype flying. Here it's a prototype of the GJ-21 carrier-borne stealth unmanned combat aircraft, or UCAF. It is designed to be accommodated on the Type 076 amphibious assault ship that we talked about in last week's video. If you haven't watched that, click the link on the right corner above. The GJ-21 has already been inducted into service and was featured in the VJ Day Parade a few weeks back. But instead of being put at the back of a truck, we have now seen it flying. On top of that, research papers related to the GJ-21 were also posted on Chinese social media, revealing more details of its design. And bombshells just keep coming. We now have posts on social media about China sharing its progress on the next generation jet engine design. At least one tech demonstrator of the engine was produced and put under ground level and high altitude testing. Last but not the least, the PLA Navy's third carrier and the first with electromagnetic catapults, the Fujian, was formally commissioned into service. All the above content could not be reasonably fitted into one episode with the depth I wish to cover. So I will break them down into two themes. One is the development of Chinese next generation combat aircraft, which I intend to cover in this episode. The other theme is the development of Chinese carrier and carrier aviation, which I will cover in a later video. If you found all these interesting and want to hear more PLA OSINT, click subscribe and hit the bell so you can get notified for new videos. Now, let's dive into it. Story number one is definitely going to give to the J-36. A large, tailless, next-generation manned combat aircraft that was first public seen flying on December 26, 2024. Here I want to start off with a more careful description of the aircraft to avoid the is it a sixth generation and is it a fighter or a bomber debate that quickly ensued as soon as the footage hit the internet. To be fair, the first prototype airframe indeed has features making classification more vague. There are a few general characteristics that we can deduce about the J-36 from its first prototype. First of all, the J-36 is a big plane. In some of the earlier footage, we can see a J-20 5th generation fighter acted as the chase plane for the J-36. There were instances that these two aircraft flew pretty close to each other. Hence, we can get a sense of the size of the J-36 using J-20 as a reference. The J-36 is significantly larger. Remember, the J-20 is by no means a small aircraft. In fact, with more than 20 meter or 65 feet in length and more than 13 meter or 42 feet in wingspan, it is the largest among all in-service fifth generation fighters. Second, broadband stealth is definitely a top priority. The aircraft adopts a tailless design without the vertical stabilizer. The vertical stabilizer is one of the biggest source of radar reflection for longer wavelengths radars in the current fifth generation fighter design, because the size of the vertical stabilizers are similar to the wavelengths of certain VHF radars, and they will give a strong reflection due to resonance. By removing that, the J-36 is designed to be low observable against radars that can pick up current fifth generation fighters from a longer distance but there's always going to be trade-offs in engineering. Without the vertical stabilizer, which is responsible for Yo in the traditional aircraft design, more complex aerodynamic designs and control laws are required. And they are not always as effective. Combined with the large size of the airframe, it is reasonable to question the agility of the J-36 as a fighter. Third, the tailless double delta configuration of the J-36 indicates that the aircraft is designed with high speed in mind. The wing configuration reduces drag during supersonic flight, so it is reasonable to assume the aircraft is designed for an extended supercruise flight. Fourth, thanks to its size, 
The aircraft has a very spacious nose section that is able to accommodate a large EO window on each side, a large radar and a side-by-side -side cockpit. This is not mentioning an equally generous internal weapons bay. At this point, we know that the J-36 is a large, stealthy aircraft, possibly not very agile, well designed to fly very fast and very far with a large payload of advanced sensors. Is it a fighter, a bomber, a fighter bomber, or an interceptor? Or none of the above because the future battle space of a potential peer-to-peer -peer conflict demands a new taxonomy of combat aircraft. The second prototype of the J-36 may offer some answers. It was seen flying early in the week of October 27, likely near the Chengdu Aircraft Corporation's facility. There are multiple visible changes compared to the first prototype. The current inlets on the first one were changed to divertless supersonic inlets. The tandem twin-wheel main landing gear was redesigned into a side-by-side -side configuration. But the most prominent change is the engine exhaust. On the first prototype, the three engine exhausts are recessed into the fuselage. This design is also adopted by various American stealth aircraft such as the B-2, B-21, F-117 and YF-23. The design is aimed to shield the hot engine exhaust directly out of the engine nozzle and give it time to cool down a little in order to reduce the infrared signal emitted. But on the second prototype, that feature is gone. Instead, we can see exposed engine exhausts and what appear to be two-dimensional thrust vectoring mechanisms. Given the lack of clearer image, this could be an educated assumption, but a very probable one as we have seen a direct image of another Chinese next-generation combat aircraft design, the JXD, for lack of a better name, using two-dimensional thrust vectoring nozzles. By having the exposed thrust vectoring nozzles, the second prototype indicates the user's willingness to trade some of low observability away for additional maneuverability. And this makes me more inclined to believe that the J-36 will play a heavy air dominance role. To think of it, the J-36 is a large, long-range, high-payload, high-speed, somewhat maneuverable, manned platform with a strong emphasis on broadband stealth. That fits many of the requirements set out for the US Air Force's next-generation air dominance program in various official, think tank and defense contractor studies. The second story is also deeply connected to the development of Chinese next-generation combat aircraft. We now have a rather comprehensive understanding of the basic design and progress of one of China's adaptive cycle engines. As per these photos suggested, at least one engine of a specific design is produced and has already been put through various ground tests. Before reading too much into this design, I want to highlight that this project is fully controlled by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, rather than any research institute that has a closer relationship to the Chinese military industrial complex. So this design might just go as far as a tech demonstrator. But it highlights China's commitment to catch up and lead in the development of future jet propulsion systems. A disclaimer before going forward, I am far from an engine expert, so I may get many things terribly wrong here. I welcome any correction in the comment section. Now let's talk more about adaptive cycle engines. In jet engine design, fuel efficiency, thrust, and speed of the aircraft are always carefully traded off against each other. To wildly simplify, we can imagine that there are two extremes. An engine can be designed to be highly fuel efficient at a given thrust at subsonic speed or be fuel efficient at a given thrust at supersonic speed, but not both. To further simplify, we can work with the assumption that if a turbofan engine can bypass more air from its core, then it is going to be more efficient at subsonic speed. Think about the engine on a commercial airliner. The more traditional low bypass turbofan engines used on fighters tend to make compromises to strike a very fine balance with lower fuel efficiency during subsonic flight compared to a high bypass turbofan, but significantly more efficient during supersonic flight. To talk more about the Chinese adaptive cycle engine design, let's first have a look at the more widely known American design as an introduction. 
the most common base design adopted by both the two leading contractors, General Electric and Pratt Whitney, is the three-string design, in which air sucked into the engine split into three air ducts for different purposes, while in more traditional designs, there are only two air streams running through the engine. Let's take General Electric's XA100 engine as an example. The first stream runs through the core of the engine, which is compressed by the compressor blades mixed with fuel, pushed through combustion. This process creates the jet stream that shoots out of the engine. The second stream is the main bypass stream. It bypasses the core, used to provide more thrust more efficiently during subsonic, transonic, and lower end of supersonic speed. These two streams work together akin to a traditional low bypass turbofan engine. Since this stream is not mixed with fuel and pushed through combustion before the afterburner, it is described as a cold stream. The third stream is where the design significantly differs. Another cold stream is introduced into the engine through a third, most outer duct. This stream also bypasses the engine core. It provides more thrust and fuel efficiency during subsonic cruise and at the same time providing more cooling capacity for onboard systems. During subsonic cruise, air is pushed into all three streams, with more air bypassing the core compared to the traditional two-stream design. The engine is now effectively a higher bypass ratio engine. During supersonic flight, a more significant portion of air is pushed into just the first and second streams. The engine is now effectively a low bypass turbofan, more optimized for supersonic flight. Okay, finally, we get to talk about the Chinese design revealed recently. We can see it is clearly a three-stream design, but the similarities between it and the US design ends pretty much here. The Chinese design introduced an interstage turbine burner aka ITB, in the second stream, which effectively gives the engine two hot air streams and one cold air stream. What is an interstage turbine burner? Let's first have a look at a traditional turbofan engine design without it. We can see air coming into the engine through the intake, passing the fan, then going through the compressor to increase pressure. Once the air is slowed down through the compressor and then mixed with fuel, the condition is set for more efficient combustion in the combustor. After a kaboom, more gas is created, expanded, and shoots out of the combustor, driving two sets of turbines. The jet streams first go through the high-pressure turbines, which drive the compressor. After that, it passes through the low-pressure turbines that further drive the fan. Then the jet stream enters into the afterburner. More fuel can be mixed with the jet stream and be further ignited if more thrust is needed by the pilot. Remember that in the afterburner, we are effectively trying to burn fuel with the exhaust coming out of the combustor, so the fuel efficiency would be significantly poorer when the afterburner is engaged. We can imagine that the interstage turbine burner as a combustor placed between the high-pressure turbines and the low-pressure turbines, aka interstage. The combustion there would provide a stronger jet stream that drives the fan faster, which creates more thrust. In its original form, the IBT is placed in tandem with the combustor, so it also tries to burn fuel using oxygen-poor exhaust. The elegance in the Chinese adaptive cycle engine design is integrating the interstage turbine burner into the second airstream, so that it is burning fuel with oxygen-rich fresh air, which significantly increases fuel efficiency for getting an additional boost to the low-pressure turbine, and also produces additional jet stream and thrust shooting out from the nozzle. In this sense, there is no need for an afterburner. To summarize, the American design aims to be adaptive, aka easily switching from subsonic and supersonic mode by regulating the flow of air between the third stream and the two other streams, effectively adjusting bypass ratio as needed. The Chinese design, on the other hand, aims to be adaptive by adjusting the number of combustors. In the subsonic mode, the Chinese engine works very similarly to the US ones, with two cold streams and one hot stream. 
in supersonic mode, the Chinese engine will fire up its interstage turbine burner, changing one cold stream into a hot stream. This increases thrust significantly without the need of resorting to the fuel guzzling afterburner. In short, the American design is optimized to extend the subsonic cruise range, while the Chinese design is optimized to extend super cruise range. The divergence in design philosophies is likely the result of tactical and strategic imperatives in a potential West Pacific face-off between the US and China. The tyranny of distance in the theater puts more pressure on the American air power than the Chinese, as spaces along the first island chain will be put under significant threats and even rendered inoperable for an extended period. That means American combat aircraft need to be sent from far away bases. So fuel efficiency and range in the subsonic speed regime is paramount. On the other hand, the Chinese aircraft are fighting closer to home. For them, being able to supercruise as much as possible would provide more tactical advantages. For example, being able to lob long-range air-to-air missiles at a faster speed. But again, such an assessment is based on just this one example of Chinese adaptive cycle engine design. It needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt, because from open source information, we know China has multiple programs running. From a word citations published in 2018, we know that the first Chinese variable cycle engine tech demonstrator was built and fired up by AECC, or Aero Engine Corporation of China, which is the producer of most of China's jet engines. It serves as the foundation for the development for adaptive cycle engines. And here, we can see multiple patents filed for various technologies used in variable cycle engines by different institutes within the AECC, hinting at the possibility of multiple parallel programs. And we need to note that it is highly likely that AECC is the true developer for the PLA sanctioned projects. Since those projects are wrapped under greater secrecy, we don't know what specific designs and trade-offs were made. To close off, China has made tremendous progress in its aerospace industry in the past three decades. Back in the 1990s, while the US started to fly its fifth generation tech demonstrator, the YF-22 and the YF-23, China was still developing a new third generation variant of the MiG-21. In the early 2000s, when the US was making progress with the F-35, China only started to test and induct its first domestically produced fourth generation fighter, the J-10, with Russian engines. In the early to mid 2010s, when the US already had almost 200 F-22 and was producing dozens of F-35s a year, China was hammering out its own fifth generation fighters, the J-20. And today, both the US and China are neck to neck in the development of sixth generation combat aircraft and next generation jet propulsion systems. What will come next, I am not so sure. But as the past few episodes illustrated, we seem to have always get something new coming out of China every week. So don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. See you next time.